Hello and welcome to Divine Intervention, 365 Days of World Building. Uh, yesterday we talked about the magic of the continent of awe and of divine intervention. And today I thought we'd do like a brief overview of the main gods for the nations of divine intervention. Uh, the first god we have for the Horfrost nation, which are the guys up in the Winterlands, is Fajit. Fajit is a cold and unforgiving god. Um, his main attributes that he grants to his followers are like endurance uh a lot of snow spells earth spells uh he's associated with mountains and blizzards um he's a tough god he's a tough god to to please um he some of the attributes that his peoples uphold are like self-preservation um toughness they're ones who are more likely to like do things themselves uh, not rely on others um, one of the, the, the aspects of their nation in general is a lot of the towns are named after like the person who settled first um, as in like who was that guy who went out into the wilderness and was like ah we're gonna live here and so a lot of the <laughs> towns are named after like sled was a family um that settled here and within that mentality the farther north you get uh and let me see if we can bring up let's drop down here it's so, like the the So the farther north you get, the more into um, and so the farther into the Fajit like territory that you get, the mountains are taller, the snows and the storms are greater, and so there's this respect for these people that live up in that area, um, because they're like the harshest, most brutal like people, uh, and they they see themselves better than everybody else in the world the world although a lot of the nations will think that they're better than the other ones but in this community they see themselves as like the greatest or the most like physician of the whole like nation uh next up is czars czars is a massive two-headed like worm dragon um kind of thing and it basically has these crazy like heads at the end of each on each side and what it does is it just tunnels through its area of its worshipers and it creates these huge valleys and terrains and it just spreads disease and death like wherever it goes uh, and its main central place is here in the czar's cavern and there's where like the central um <clears throat> like settlement is of the, the tribes of the valley and that's where they they like take care of czars they um keep track of like the offspring they sacrifice like almost hourly to czars and uh czars favor uh so czars is like the epitome of chaos and and death and so his the tribes of the valley uh, a lot of their magic comes from blood sacrifice and ritual sacrifices and just slaughtering and slaying um and the way their works they work is basically all the different tribes uh specialize in like a way of death and death magic um <clears throat> so you have like the tribe of stone and they cast these death spells that leave people like rock hard and stone um or you have like the tribe of goo and they're left in like pile of oozes um 
next up, we have the Everfolk. Let's see. We have the Everfolk. The Everfolk have... They don't have one god. So we're going to... As this intro series goes, we'll talk about some other different stuff. But uh, in the next two days, we're going to talk about the Pact of Awe, uh, which is what led to all these nations kind of consolidating in the Six Nations. And the Everfolk, they worship dire animals. And so when this treaty happened, they had to come underneath like a banner of one. Um, and they weren't able to resolve it. And so they have three major gods. They have uh, j Paul, which is this massive, I mean, I mean, quite massive elephant <clears throat> that has this huge city on its back. Uh, and the elephant actually, let's see, is this still up? The elephant actually, like, travels, and it's one of the main sources of trading throughout um, the Everfolk. And so what it does is they they ride on the elephant and there's this huge city and capital there and they travel throughout the woods and they line up like dockings that are on the elephant with dockings that are on these settlements and they trade off goods it's this massive elephant just like travels a loop um and you can kind of see they kind of control it with these like chains that are on the tusk and it's a whole environment where they take care of jaypole and Joe Paul kind of like brings this back to them. Uh, one of the other, one of the other gods of the Everfolk is this giant like four wings bat thing that lives in Wanakabat. Wanakabat, yeah, Wanakabat. Um, <clears throat> and that's the name of the, the beast. And basically, they've been worshiping him for a long time, and. Wanakabat used to be like only a couple stories tall and they worship him in this temple that's guarded by these like giant albino gorillas and Wanakabat has gotten to the point where they've fed him so much that he can't actually leave the temple anymore and he's kind of stuck in this underground swamp temple thing uh, and the Wanakabat they're on like the border of the tribes of the valley and so some of their magic is kind of influenced from that death magic and it's a lot of uh, life magic that the Everfolk have, but it's also like the two sides of the coin where it's life and death. Um, and so like this whole stretch down here is a lot of um, focus on the dire animals, but also plants and like plants that can poison you and do different effects and things like that. And so that's some of the magic that they get from Wanakabat. Uh, and then the last one is the honeybee, which is this giant honeybee. And... They live, and it's called Honeyloft, and Honeyloft is right here. And this is their, the Everfolk's main central trading to the outside world. Um, so the Wanderers of the Unseen go around the whole continent and trade with everybody, because that's what the Wanderers do. And then when they get to the Everfolk, they kind of come up here, they trade with these guys, but they come in and they port in Honeyloft. And Honeyloft is this city that's inside this huge honeycomb. So you can kind of see. Um, thought I had a better picture of that. There we go. Yeah, so you can kind of see. And so it's a it's a city that's this monastery. It started off as a monastery that worshipped this giant honeybee. And there's all these huge honeycombs. And what they do is they, they port in from the outside through one of these honeycombs the ocean and the boats come in it's a one-way stretch and then they come down in the honey like river and then come back out into the ocean and so they dock while they're in there and they trade and so a lot of the wanderers will come in there and then there's different like river wanderers that come up and then they'll meet up with j-pole and then they'll that's how like trades from all these different nations down here will get up into the everfolk and they'll come down like that um which you can kind of see that's the trade route of the risen hall so the honeybee is kind of like a unique situation because the honeybee really only comes by like once every hundred years or so and so 
there's this like weird mentality where they never really know if their god's gonna come back but basically the honeybee's always out you know looking for flowers and things like that and then it settles down every hundred years and fills in like a honeycomb with honey All right, so then, let's see. Then we have the Wanderers of the Unseen. Now, the Unseen doesn't have an official name uh, and has never been, like, fully seen by his worshipers. Uh, the Unseen is arguably the largest of all the gods, and it resides in the ocean. And it literally does that because it just wouldn't work on land. Um... And most people, it's just like a conglomerate of tentacles and water and energy and just like this blob of life. Um, <clears throat> and it has a chaotic nature like we were talking about yesterday that's like closer to the yellow on the scale. Um, and that's kind of like how the wanderers love traveling. Or people who love traveling become wanderers. And so... The, the unseen kind of grants those powers of water. Um, a lot of the sorceresses also have power over like tempests and storms. Uh, it's not unseen for like the wanderers to, if they, had, wanderers for the most part, because they're so easygoing and chaotic, they're like the traders and they get along with everybody. But if they were to attack a place, they'll usually flood out the area as much as they can and then come in with their boats even if it like has been dry land forever uh so that's kind of what the unseen does for them and it's said between that nation that the unseen like when the water comes and goes it's from the unseen breathing While no one's ever seen the Unseen, the Wanderers of the Unseen have this giant floating capital called Risen Hall. And it's basically this huge port that, as story goes, um, it was once like these like six ships that were shipwrecked. And they ended up just like tying the ships together. And that's how they were able to get off the island. Uh, and Risen Hall is supposed to be those ships but what's happened is over the years all these ships will port in and like i said uh the wanderers are really like easy going and so when they have events and things in their capital ships will come in and dock like just anywhere around the outer perimeter and if it's like one of those couple like decades where they have like the massive festivals ships will get like trapped in there uh to the point where like some of them open up shop and they're in there for like a decade before they get to untie and leave again uh, and then, so, while no one's really ever seen, like, the Unseen in its full form, which is one of the reasons he's called Unseen, uh, they do have this thing called the Conduit, which is somebody, like, every 35 or so years takes up the mantle of the Conduit, and in the center of Risen Hall, there's this throne, and it's basically a person, and I want to draw this when we start talking about Risen Hall, like, on Risen Hall's day. But the conduit is basically a person who has, like, it's like this giant throne chair where you sit there and all the tentacles, like, from the Unseen come up from the center of Risen Hall. And that's how the Unseen is able to talk to his, like, worshippers and give orders. It's through the conduit. Uh, and then next we have Fogin Finn, which is the Protectors of the Blade. And they're here. Uh, Fogenfin is one of the elemental gods, and Fogenfin can consist mostly of just like fire and energy in a metal suit. Uh, and Fogenfin will come to his worshippers like in fire, and a lot of their land is just full of lava, and it's volcanic. And like the people of Fogenfin are very temperamental. They're fiery people. They're quick to temper. They're quick to fight. Um, and that's what they got to get their strength from. <clears throat> their magic will consist of lava and fire and also, like, earthquakes. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
and they're called the protectors of the blade because they they keep the blade of Fogenfin safe for when he comes back in his full form. Uh, and then so that's kind of like what that whatever that image was. Protectors of the blade. So that's Fogenfin's blade. Um, they're also because they have like that power over like fire and heated substance and things like that. They're also really good like smiths. Really good with metalwork. Um, <clears throat> the last god we have is Astral. And Astral is another elemental god. And he consists mostly of like cosmos and space and like Vesper, Vesper just essence like in its concentrated like explosive form. Um, so very much more of like a magic missile astral kind of like caustic kind of plasma uh, and he's this just giant floating being of energy astral is somebody who will come to people in their dreams uh, he'll come to them like th through rituals and seances there's a great deal of knowledge and runes that's involved with astral uh one of the things that their whole like kingdom upholds is knowledge and so a lot of these almost each one of these capitals on here is either like a labyrinth or some sort of puzzle or some sort of way to like prove your intelligence over other people and through those kind of rituals that's how you get to be close to astral um and then in reward astral is one of the it, it's they're the greatest spell casters out of all the nations uh, they're the most powerful. They have this unique ritual where you actually have to die to become like a top tier, like warlock, uh, witch kind of spellcaster mage, uh, and you come back in like full astral form. There's a big, there are um, because they're the ones who kind of upheld intelligence, and there's something we'll get into when we start talking about the Pact of Ob. But basically, they're the ones who came together, and kind of manipulated the other six nations to build this area down here lunarium um and the lunarium is this giant facility in the center where they signed the the pack of awe but it really is it goes along with that motive of having these places built for rituals and it is in fact like a whole conduit for um for reaching out to astral for like great power and we'll get more into that when we talk about the pact of all later in, in the week all right well that's day three uh thanks for joining us for divine intervention 365 days of world building